Howdy folks, Dr. Will Wong here. Let me take a little bit of your time to correct some recently published systemic enzyme misconceptions. Now these uh, misconceptions were published in a daily newsletter put out by a very well-known doc who I respect. Met him and spoke to him a bunch of years ago. He probably doesn't remember me from Adam, but that's neither here nor there. First misconception was that natokinase is 30 times stronger than seropeptidase. Now, he quoted studies. Yes, those studies, when you look at them, look quite valid. My question is, who did the studies and who paid for them? There are two companies that I can think of at the present moment in time. One of them being Nestle, that a few years ago bought out Mucos Pharma, the makers of Wobenzyme. And they licensed Wobenzyme in the United States to two separate companies, one selling to doctors and one selling to regular folks. And the formulas are a bit different, but that's neither here nor there. And the other company in Japan, makers of some big-time seropeptidase products, but they were actually been cited by the Ministry of Health in Japan as making a dead product, and they had to yank that product from the market shelves a few years back because it just plain didn't work. So let's say either one of these companies or both cooked up a superfied version of natokinase. They went, since all the enzymes that are not from animals or from vegetables or fruit are basically fermented in vats, both seropeptase and natokinase, one of these companies cooks up a superfied version of natokinase. Very powerful, very acid resistant, stronger than the usual natokinase had by just making natto curd. And they want to test it and they want to compare it and they want to show its superiority. What do you test it against? You've got a pharmaceutical grade enzyme product and you find a scientist and you give them the project of testing the new natokinase product and making it look really good against the opposition. What's the opposition? Opposition to natokinase and seropeptidase. Seratiopeptidase, or just plain seropeptase, whichever term you want to use, it talking about the same thing. So you use this new superfied augmented natokinase, and you test it on a substrate, something that it will eat, and you test it against seropeptidase. Now, what kind of seropeptidase are you going to test it against? Are you going to test it against another pharmaceutical-grade seropeptidase? Are you going to test it against a food-grade seropeptidase? Are you going to test it against an agricultural-grade seropeptidase like that used in animal feed? What are you going to test it against? Well, if you're smart and you want to make your bosses happy, you use the lowest grade of seropeptidase you can find, which is food and agricultural grade, and you compare your pharmaceutical grade product to that food or agricultural grade product in eating away at your substrates. And of course, you're going to get a really good result because there are very few products out there for human consumption that are not sold only by prescription that contain pharmaceutical grade proteolytic enzymes. I will tell you that myzyme essence happens to be one of those, if not one of the only one of those. I know of two companies that have pharmaceutical-grade enzymes in their products besides us. And then you come out and you publish your study, which, of course, you're going to get it published because of the folks who are backing you. You're for sure going to get it published, and it's going to look good, and you're going to do well selling the wares of the people who funded your studies. But what is the actual authority on proteolytic enzymes? Is it some study paid for by a pharmaceutical company? Is there an independent source of grading or of being able to know what a pharmaceutical grade natokinase would actually do against a pharmaceutical grade seropeptidase? And yes, there is such a tome. It's called the Handbook of proteolytic enzymes. It's actually two textbooks big, rather thick textbooks. The set cost me 700 and change in dollars when I bought mine. And it's revised every so often, and you can get the revisions. But the handbook on proteolytic enzymes is the unbiased 
source of information for how well an enzyme does against a substrate versus another enzyme does against a substrate. Now, each enzyme has its own particular set of substrates that it eats through, but in terms of fibrinolysis, much the same substrates are used, usually an oatmeal and a gelatin substrate. But not always. Some enzymes are so particular about what what they eat that they have to be tested against those particular substrates because if you test them against the usual ones, they won't work that well. So natokinase works against the oatmeal substrate and the gelatin substrate really, really, really well. It is a super, super, super fibrinolytic enzyme. eats through all the fibrin in the oatmeal, which is a lot like the fibrin we have in our scar tissue and fibrosis, believe it or not. And the serapeptidase enzyme eats through the same substrates as well, if not a little better, according to the handbook. Now, remember that serapeptidase was initially created by the silkworm to eat through its cocoon so the pretty butterfly can come out and fly. Now, what is the cocoon made of? Cocoons are made out of silk. That's what we make silk from. Silk is almost exactly like human connective tissue, made of the same stuff, just stronger. You can put a bunch of pieces of silk together and basically create a bulletproof vest if you make it thick enough. You can hang a piece of silk by its top two ends on a clothesline, shoot at it, and the bullet won't penetrate, but it will raise the silk and graze it, but it won't go through it. That's how strong silk is. But it's almost exactly like a stronger version of the scar tissue we make internally when we create fibrosis. So if the serapeptidase can eat through the silk, it can certainly eat through human or mammalian fibrosis. So the handbook of proteolytic enzymes has an autokinase and the serapeptidase almost neck and neck. Now, on the subject of lumbokinase, lumbokinase is supposed to be several hundred times stronger than either serapeptidase or natokinase, according to the textbook of proteolytic enzymes. But think of the substrates the earthworm has to eat through while he's making the lumbokinase. And if you didn't know that lumbokinase came from earthworms, you do now. What do earthworms eat through? They eat through the dirt. Okay, what's dirt? Dirt is basically ancient poop along with organic material of dead leaves, dead wood, with some sand and an occasional rock. Do you have anything inside of your body resembling that kind of ancient material with the sand, maybe the rocks, maybe we can leave the rocks out. Although earthworms eat the rocks, they use them in a gizzard. So is there any substrate in the human body or the mammalian body that resembles lumbokinase? Again, think about what the earthworm has to eat through. Think about what's inside your body in terms of maybe fibrosis or maybe inflammation. Does a lumbokinase have the ability that natokinase and serapeptidase do to eat pro-inflammatory cytokines? And if it doesn't find the right substrate inside of our bodies, how do we know if it's working or not if we can't feel it working? Serious inflammation patients can feel the natokinase working. Serious inflammation patients can feel the serapeptidase working when they're pharmaceutical grade, when they're strong enough. But do people actually feel the anti, any anti-inflammatory effect from taking lumbokinase? Can you test for the reduction of C-reactive protein? Can you test for the reduction of homocysteine if using lumbokinase? Has that ever been done? It's been done for the other enzymes. Why can't you do it for lumbokinase to prove that it'll work inside of a human or a mammal? To reduce inflammation as well as the natokinase, the serapeptidase, and to a lesser degree, the other proteolytic enzymes like pancreatin, bromelain, papain, etc. The next point of controversy was the comment that enzymes needed to be cycled or they lose their effectiveness in the body. This is patently ridiculous. Think about your pancreas making enzymes. It either makes them or it doesn't. 
if it makes them, you're hunky-dory and you're fine. When it stops making them, you go into decline and get sick. When does the body ever cycle the making of something that it needs unless there's a downturn in production because of sickness? If the body doesn't cycle its own making of proteolytic enzymes, then why does the body have to cycle the taking of enzymes from an external source? Do you kind of see where I'm going at here? In the years that I spent studying proteolytic enzymes, including the time I spent in Germany, and studying the nearly 200 studies and clinical experience reports that Mucos Pharma had published in peer-reviewed legitimate medical journals, there was never a time when any of the doctors, the physicians who were applying the proteolytic enzymes with actual human patients, there was never a time when any of the researchers thought that the enzymes needed to be cycled. Never. In the 25 plus years that I've been working with proteolytic enzymes, I've never come upon a reason to have to cycle the enzymes. You're a a serious fibromyalgia patient. You're a serious chronic pain patient. You're a serious chronic inflammation patient. Do you really want to take time off from what's lowering your inflammation, eating away the fibrosis that the inflammation is creating, making all of your symptoms come back and bite you just to cycle because someone says you need to cycle this stuff? Oh, but they've got the answer. They're going to use omega-3s. They're going to use turmeric and cumin and all the other herbs to lower your inflammation. Those aren't worth a rat's ass. They're not even worth a baby aspirin compared to the atomic bomb against inflammation, the atomic bomb against fibrosis, which are the proteolytic enzymes. In 40 years of working with chronic pain patients, I have never once, not once, heard of a chronic pain patient feeling so much better from taking any of those spices, or from taking the omega-3s. That's a laugh. It's a joke. And I would venture to say that the doctors who make those statements either are strictly research docs or their practice doesn't entail a lot of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chronic pain patients, chronic lower back pain, spinal stenosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, patients. Because if they were dealing with a lot of inflammation, if they were dealing with a lot of the fibrosis that inflammation causes in everything from CA to Parkinson's, if they were treating it every day and treating it seriously, not just counting the office visits that keeps an office afloat, but the actual well-being of their patients, trying to treat them in the shortest amount of time, trying to actually cure them, or if you can't cure them, find a remedy, a lasting remedy that will work for them. Any doc who's ever tried the omega-3s, the turmeric, the cumin, or anything else that supposedly lowers inflammation and eats away at fibrosis, none of it works. I'm also kind of warning against the advice of doctors who themselves don't have chronic pain issues chronic fatigue issues, fibromyalgia issues, chronic old-time injury issues, who might have a sprained ankle here and there, might have a bump on the head, might have this, might have that, but don't have the injuries found in, let's say, high-level pro football players or veterans who've just come back from special operations in the wars or chronic fatigue patients who can't get up out of bed and are hurt everywhere of Parkinson's and other head trauma patients who are growing fibrosis in their brains because their brains are chronically inflamed. Same goes for mononucleosis patient. There are mononucleosis patients out there who have chronic mono. They have means they have chronic brain inflammation and the inflammation is causing a fibrosis and the fibrosis is causing all the bad things that fibrosis causes, i.e. loss of memory, eventual dementia, maybe Alzheimer's, because we find the cross protein cross-linking, the amyloidosis growth in any kind of a brain-related injury, in any kind of a brain-related condition. The only way to control those, the only way on God's green earth, is to eat them away with a working proteolytic enzyme. 
since they're just regular fibrosis and not earthworm food, then it makes sense to use enzymes that are like the substrates they are meant to eat. So maybe it's not a bad idea when looking for a doc to treat your chronic inflammation, to treat your chronic fibrosis conditions, to treat whatever long-term inflammatory or fibrosis diseases you've got. Maybe it's not a bad idea to find a doc that actually got what you're trying to fight because they have a world of clinical experience that the doc who only occasionally treats stuff like that and then doesn't think about it for all that much until the patient comes back the next time, they have a better hand. They have a better source of experience on treating inflammation with the enzymes or with the other things that they may use, combination of enzymes and medication, whatever they might throw at it, they have a better grounding in treating those conditions than the docs who just occasionally dabble at it. And with that, I will end my rant. I wish you all God's blessings, be well, and I'll chat with you again next time. Bye-bye.